today's program, Carol Quantuck is a relatively new CDHS member, an environmental advocate. She's been an active birder for over 40 years and is the editor of the Audubon Society of the Capital Region newsletter, Wing Beats. Her interest and passion for native plant gardening evolved from extensive real-time experience in gardening and becoming a Cornell Cooperative Extension for Saratoga County Master Gardener in May of last year. She recently retired from 50 plus years work work life ending with the position as secretary to the superintendent of schools in the Scotia Glenville school, Dis school district. She has a bachelor's degree in geography and urban slash regional planning from SUNY Albany and a graduate management certificate from Cornell University's New York State School of Industrial and Labor Relations. She's currently enrolled in a bird biology course, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, as well as other bird related mini courses. She is also an accomplished sewist and has a large doll collection. And with that, I give you Carol Quantock. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to start sharing my screen here so we can get into this. I will do a disclaimer here uh, just to let everybody know here that. I am not by no means an expert on gardening. This is a just a what I would call a tip of the iceberg native plant primer. Uh, and by all means, uh, ask away as far as questions. You know, I'll I'll try to answer. And if I don't uh, if I don't know the answer to something, I will try to get the answer to you within short order. So bear with me here. I'm going to share screen. There it is, right there. Okay, sharing, and we're going to get rid of this. Uh, let's see, start from the beginning. There it is. Okay, native. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Am I? Uh, can everybody hear? You, you're coming through loud and clear. Could you Excellent. go to the share the screen, the presentation, rather than uh, the PowerPoint? Okay. Whoops. I thought I did that already. Here, bear with me. Okay. Do 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 do. There we go. It's not like it's these PowerPoints don't behave like plants, do they? No, they don't. They're it's not being very cooperative here. Bear, new share. Okay. Uh, okay. Share screen. All right. Share. And let's see. There we go. Is that better? I don't know why it's not working here. Uh, we well, still see the same thing. Okay, it says you are screen sharing here. So, so on the for you the presentation, if you could start the slideshow and that we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. Whoops. How's that? Is that not doing anything? Let's try still the same. Still the same. Okay. I'm really sorry about this. I don't well, then we can we can just live with it this way. Okay. Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay. Well, the, okay, so it's Native Plant Gardening 101. So it's an introduction. Basically, um, I didn't want to, there are myriad pieces of native plant gardening and philosophies, uh, plants themselves, insects, and what it all means. And I look at it as a great circle of life type thing. Um, and there we are. And so it's, how it, it's a it's right now it's a trendy thing, especially since pandemic began. It's uh, kind of a um, um, became popular because of the pandemic. People didn't have a lot to do, so therefore a lot of gardening. And that's in this case not a bad thing. I am not a big trend person. I don't like fashion trendiness, but in this case it's environmentally sound. It's a good thing. Uh, native plants themselves, they're low maintenance, low maintenance, easy to grow. They've been they've been here for millennia. They support our native insects, native birds, wildlife. Um, they are they're thought of as weeds. A lot of uh, uh, excuse me, uh, violets. Uh, I. I have talked to other master gardeners who have said, oh, violets are terrible, I rip them out. I don't rip them out, I think they're wonderful. And they are a host plant for the great spangled fritillary butterfly, which is something you really have to look at 
um, in your lawn or in your, your yard and check out all the insects and all the birds and all the, the uh, fauna that frequent our plants and look, take a look and see uh, about, especially the early, the early bloomers, the eph ephemeral spring plants that come out like violets, like uh, pussy toes and little, little things like that that are in your lawn that are attracting bees and little early butterflies and little insects that are pollinating, that are feeding. These things are very important because they are part of the circle of life. And I will get started <laughs> by saying how I got started doing plant native plant gardening, or at least gardening per se, was a swimming pool. We, and uh, this is just a, it's, it's a funny story. I love it. Uh, back in the day, um, I hope you can see these photos. Back in the day, we had, uh, when we first moved here, we had an above ground pool. Carol, you need to, yes. you need to advance the slide. We're just seeing your oh. title slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. I see they're advancing for me. So uh, we're, you're, you're in the presentation. We're looking at the PowerPoint. It's, they're not, they're just on the PowerPoint. You're on the first slide. Okay. Well, there. Okay. So there, how's that? Oops. Still, still the same. Okay, this is um, this is making me crazy here. So, all right, bear with me. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to start this again. Pardon me, and I apologize for this. This is uh, all right. So it's telling me share screen. Okay, sharing options. Okay, Carol, try clicking on the left side on the slide that you want to share. Okay. There we are. Share that. Let's see. All right. Now I'm going to have to go back because this is good. Good. Is this working now? This is this is great. Thank you, Carol. Okay. I apologize. I really That's do. Okay. Uh, uh, it's so it started with a swimming pool. We put in an above ground pool, and I don't know if you can see from this photo. Can you see my my cursor here? Yes. Uh, okay. Our house is up here. It's built, it's on a hill, um, and it's a landform, actually. And years ago, we had an above-ground pool. So over 20 years or so, uh, above-ground pools tend to fail after a certain amount of time. They give about 20 years. In about 20 years, the liner started to fail. So just before the economy went to uh, went to hell in a handbasket in 2008 2009 we made a decision to put in an in-ground pool so it was a little bit risky but we didn't realize it at the time we thought that now oh, well you know we can do this and fine um and uh Anyway, that's what the pool looks like it's a uh, it's a lovely pool beautiful pool but our problem was way, when they cut, for, cut the ground for the pool, when they dug for it, this whole area right here was just this big glaring, ugly, raw dirt. And looking at it, I just said, well, this is awful. I'm, and I'm not really a neat freak at all. Uh, <laughs> And usually in my yard was my yard, you know, whatever. There's lots of weeds in there and crabgrass and all sorts of fun stuff. But I really didn't think that that looked very good. If you put in, you know, if you take the trouble and time to get something like this put in, you want it to look halfway decent. So uh, we put in, and now there's a photo over here of a... Uh, Retaining wall. So we built this little retaining wall and put a little fountain in. These plants here are just basic hostas. And I started putting in, just to make it look better, I put in hostas and bleeding hearts. And these are non-native plants. Uh, I put in a lot of non-native plants because I had no idea what I was doing. I just, you know, okay, let's just put things in here and I'm still paying for that today. And we'll get onto that in a minute. But so putting these things over in, um, 
then we decided to go up a little bit further. Things kind of evolved over the years. And we put in, we built a waterfall at the top of the hill and it comes down. And so there's a picture of the top of the hill. So it comes down and behind the, behind the retaining wall is a little uh, kind of a kidney shaped tub with plants in it, water, uh, aquatic plants and fun frogs. Uh, <laughs> but they, um, but the whole idea was it's, it's, it's evolving. And as it was evolving, I just kept thinking to myself, wait a minute, we're, I'm not really doing anything for the environment here. I'm, I put in hostas, I put in lilies, Asiatic lilies, I put in uh, crazy things, silver mound, all sorts of things that were not really native. You can see the silver mound right here. Um, so I realized that we had to we had to do something about this. This wasn't really doing anybody any good. So I started pulling out. Uh, I put in pa uh, Asia or the the uh, Asian pachysandra, which I'm still pulling, and also some vinca minor, which is periwinkle, which is also a non-native. Don't plant it; it's horrible. Um, but uh, anyway, there. So a lot of these plants have been replaced over over the, over time. And there, native plants, what are they? So now I've planted, um, ah, I think I've gone over this, uh, but um, excuse me, I kind of lost my train of thought. But anyway, there, uh, Dr. Tallamy, Dr. Doug Tallamy, who has written probably three or four books on the subject, um, has said that your, your ratio, you don't have to go entirely native plants. You don't have to, uh, the, because there are people like me who have plants that they really love that you don't want to get rid of, that you don't want to pull. The idea is to get rid of anything that is truly invasive, that is going to be literally out, out evolving or out, or out competing the natives and literally making it more difficult to support the wildlife, the native wildlife, native insects, native birds that are, that live here in our area, in our, in our uh, eco region. So native plants have co-evolved with millennia over the, in, over, with insects, animals, flora, and they can be aggressive. So uh, I'm going to take my, my favorite plant, my violets, my native uh, viola sororia, which is the regular purple violet that you see in, uh, in your lawn. Yes, they can be aggressive, uh, but they're not invasive in the eco region. This eco region, they are aggr considered aggressive, but not invasive. It's two entirely different. They are mutually exclusive. Um, a non-native plant is, uh, or a native plant is not introduced by human activity or intervention. Um, especially during the Victorian times from about me and colonial times, especially Victorian times, 1850 to 1900 approximately, there were a lot of plants that were introduced from, the, from Asia, plants and animals. Uh, so you have, that's why you have Japanese barberry here, Japanese knotweed, um, kudzu, bamboo, um, European starlings, so actually they're European, but uh, English sparrows. A um, lot of little things that people brought over because it seemed like a good idea. There were, you know, and, you know, things happened. At, at the time, there was, you know, it was just the, the, uh, the uh, beliefs of the time. And you can't, and there's nothing you can do about that because it's here already. So they really can't be eradicated entirely. Um, native plants occupy a particular region, habitat, ecosystem. Um, what our, so in this eco region uh, here might be different from something that's 350 miles away um, that it happens. It's the, that's why you try to get native plants that are native to this eco region. And I will be, I'm going to admit that I don't always do that. That's very purist. Um, sometimes it's hard to get native plants 
from growers around here. There are some that just almost impossible to get and it's expensive. So, you know, there's, there is that economically, it's not the cheapest. Um, native plants include uh, not only flowers or not only flowering plants, but grasses. There's a lot of grasses that are native that are just beautiful, just gorgeous and native trees, which especially flowering and trees that fruit bearing trees that are beautiful birds, birds just live on that, especially during the winter when they can just pick off those fruits that, uh, that they need to support themselves during the winter. Now, let's see, we colors and textures, native gardens. So everybody, you know, the, the, the common thinking is, oh, native plants, blah, blah, my, my, uh, my, my uh, garden, if I put all in natives, then it's gonna look like Joe's garden down the road, or it's gonna look like my next door neighbor's garden. Not so, it depends on how you design it, um, or if you have any design at all. I kind of tend to go random myself, but, uh, <laughs> Here are, these are pictures of actual plants that I have in my garden. There are garden beds, plural. Um, I love the, I love leaves. I really love the texture and the look and the different colors of leaves in the garden. Right here, you see these, this kind of purple pink, that is uh, native uh, wild geranium. And these right here are actually, uh, common milkweed. I put oh. them, I put them in together uh, because, and also some wood anemones in there too. That is a bed that the, uh, the anemone and the wild geranium grow first and then the, uh, the milkweed comes up or during the summer. And over to the left of that, there's a big blue mist flower plant which blooms just in time for the late monarch butterflies to sit on that nectar. This is a Jacob's Ladder, which is a native plant. It's beautiful, really pretty. It's an early bloomer. They're in bloom right now out in the yard. Um, just a really pretty, pretty little plant, interesting leaves. This is a uh, crane's bill, which also it's on the geranium family and it's very, that, look at the leaves on that. That is a fantastic, uh, just a fantastic little plant that uh, it's, uh, they do spread, they do grow nicely. And also on this side, that is Coreopsis. And uh, that is uh, a native. And uh, it, it's just, I just love the, the leaves, the, the petals, the color, you just get so many variations that you can put together or not, depending on your, you know, on what habitat you have, what you want to achieve by your garden um, and what you want to attract too. But native plants will attract just about everything you can imagine. I, I've, um, over the last 10 years or so, when I've been uh, since I've been native plant gardening, I probably have about 80 to 90% native as opposed to uh, the 70%, 70, 30. I will not get rid of all my non-natives. Um, I've got what I call some legacy plants. Um, my great grandmother's peonies, which I will not get rid of. Uh, they occupy a space in my front yard. Um, there are lilies of the valley, which I've got kind of contained, which, you know, that's a lilies of the valley will spread terribly if you let them. So the mine, it happens to be a contained spot, um, but they are non-native as, as beautiful as they are and the lovely smell, but they're non-native. So, you know, that's a, it's a choice that I had to make. Do I want to rip these out or not? Um, but they're, they were they belong to some of the originals belong to my grandmother. So it's kind of a sentimental choice that I made. Um, day lilies, the, the regular roadside lilies that you see are horribly invasive and they have come from Asia. I am still ripping out the ones that I have that when I realized what I was doing, when I didn't know what I was doing, planting those was a big mistake. Like, Yes, there are epic fails. 
And I did mention before planning Asia, um, the Asian Pachysandra and Vinca minor, which is the uh, uh, periwinkle. That's uh, really, I'm still pulling periwinkle. I'm still pulling Pachysandra. Um, I have replaced a lot of the Pachysandra with native Pachysandra. And you know, it, it grow, it's a little slower growing than the Asian, but it's a native plant. So it's better, better for the environment. Um, so there are, you know, there are things you have to make a, you do make a choice and as long as you don't overdo it and put, and people with their roses, uh, roses, forsythia, um, any of the uh, lilac bushes, they're not native, but they're beautiful. And to have one doesn't mean you're you're evil or or uh, a person who is, uh, you know, just not going along with what we should be doing for the environment. Okay, so on my this is a list of this is by no means uh, exhaustive. There are lots of lots and lots and lots of easy, most natives are easy to grow because they are extremely low maintenance um, because they're here already. They evolved, so therefore they're used to this environment. They don't need any special, or they don't need very much special care. Um, they are happy to be here. Uh, these are, I have at least some of every one of these plants in my various garden beds. Uh, I personally, I love the wild, wild geranium, which I forgot to put the uh, Latin name for. I'm, I apologize for that. That was an oversight. Uh, wild geraniums are great because they, they spread and most of these will spread given, given time. Uh, down about halfway down the list, you'll see swamp milkweed, common milkweed and butterfly weed. Those Asclepius um, species are the host plants for the monarch butterfly. Uh, swamp in common, they will lay their eggs on there plus nectar on the, on the flowers and also butterfly weed. They will lay their eggs on the butterfly weed. That's the orange butterfly weed, not the butterfly bush, which is a Bodleia, which is not native at all. And it will, Butterflies will feed on it, but they don't, it's only, the only uh, butterfly that that is a host plant for is lives in Southern California. So butterfly, butterfly bushes, not so good for here. And they are pretty. I had one at one time that, but they don't really survive well up here because it's too cold for them. They are, they are natives to Southern California. Um, Foam flower, wild bergamot, which is uh, really, it's Monarda, and there is also uh, bee balm is what it is. Bee balm, uh, and there's Monarda didyma, which is the red bee balm. Great plants for butterflies, bees just love it. Purple coneflower, fantastic plants for butterflies, and also for, if you leave them over the winter, it's a great plant for goldfinches. They love them. They love the seeds. Um, I leave mine up all winter long. This is another, that's another subject for, uh, um, for further on down this, uh, this presentation. But culver's root, uh, beard tongue, all these plants bloom at different times of the year. That's one thing that's really important for your garden in general is to have something that blooms during just as from the start of the of the growing season right up until the fall, right up until last or the frost, simply because they support the insects, the birds, the animals, uh, the hummingbirds. Uh, hummingbirds will will nectar on anything that are you know the plants that last longer into the fall, and if you can keep them going. That's great because there are there's late comers. Uh, the hummingbirds not always do they leave by September first. There, there are always some little guys that are uh, that are uh, late comers. They're they're late in their migration. And it's good to feed them. 
Joe pie weed. That is probably the easiest plant in the universe to grow. <laughs> and they are, Joe pie weed will get, and if you have Joe pie weed, you know what I mean. They get about nine or 10 feet tall. It's an amazing plant. It's awesome. They do, they do spread. They're great. Great blue, blue lobelia and its sister plant, which is the car, our, uh, cardinal flower, which is the lobelia cardinalis. Um, they are late, later in the summer, and those are hummingbird magnets. Uh, sneezeweed, which is a terrible name for it, but it's a helenium. It's really, a, it's one of the sunflower species. Um, fantastic native plant. And then I, I kind of put at the end of this list, ble uh, blue stems, the little big blue stem, big blue stem, and also Pennsylvania sedge. Those are great grasses to grow around here. There's also, um, there's lots of different grasses. You can look them up. You know, there's, I have several different species, fox, sedge, and just to experimental things, purple love grass, that's another native. Um, and they will attract different insects, different, uh, at different times of the year. This is a picture of my sun garden in the front, and that is the red bee balm. Uh, I have like four or five different kinds of bee balm in here. The in front is the, um, which bloomed a little bit later, that is the Monarda fistulosa, which is the regular wild purple bergamo that you see that the, uh, and in here there's also um, a couple of uh, varieties, uh, they are cultivars. Uh, there's Jacob Klein and uh, now the other one just escaped my, uh, escaped my head, but they are, they are two, um, they're what they call native R's. So it's kind of, you, you really want to be careful with that because a, a variety or a cultivar is not a, really a native plant, but Jacob Klein and uh, the other one whose name escapes me uh, is uh, there. They grow together with them. They do attract, but I really prefer the more these native species, the uh, the uh, Monarda didyma and the Monarda fistulosa. Um, they grow very happily together. Uh, their one downfall is they are subject to powdery mildew, which is a plant disease, which not really that bad, but it just looks pretty ugly if you're <laughs> if you're not uh, if you are that much of a purist. I kind of let nature be nature and let it do its thing. And I, um, if you've noticed by some of my pictures, a lot of brown. That's because I do not mulch with any kind of I I mulch with leaf litter. Uh, every year we take all the leaves that come down and blow them in, blow them or rake them or carry them into the garden beds and put them down there. We do not chop them because in the, uh, little creatures like to uh, overwinter there. They will overwinter, they'll find little places to go and overwinter in those leaf beds or the leaf litter. And that's where they hang out all winter long and come out in the spring so I don't like to cover it up with mulch. I like to let them let them do their thing. I do not like to bag up uh, leaf litter and put it, you know, down at the end of the driveway and have the garbage people pick it up. That's not not good. And any other excess leaves, we blow them into the woods at the back. I know a lot of people don't have woods at the back of their homes to do that, but we do, and we just, you know, and that's great because it preserves the little creatures that are out there. And they don't all, okay, there's, there's my, my uh, don't all have to be natives. Um, in this, these photos, you'll see, um, this is a Coreopsis plant that was uh, not native. This is one, one of the, uh, this is at the front of my home down near my mailbox. And there are a lot of plants in here that are not natives. This is before I, and I, most of these still exist. There are some stone crops here. Those are succulents over here. Those are not native. Um, this Coreopsis is a cultivar. And over here is a pulmonaria, which is also not native. 
Um, and you can see all the leaf litter and stuff that I just sort of leave there. Um, I also have in here some sage, and a Russian sage, which is not native, and also a, uh, an oregano plant that somebody gave me. I thought it was a great idea. Um, over here is a peony. This is one of my great grandmother's peonies that uh, uh, that I preserve. Just they're beautiful. I, I just you know I can't get rid of them. It's a sentimental thing, um, and happy to have them. So there's a seventy percent Dr. Talamy, uh, who is uh, he is actually an entomologist for those who don't know, but uh, he is he's the author of several books about letting uh, bringing nature uh, planting native plants for uh, the preservation of our environment and ourselves actually uh, down here is a zinnia this is an annual but look at this beautiful that is a that is a great spangled fritillary butterfly that is one of the ones that the violets um, support and they they can uh, that's our host plant um, the zinnia, it just happens to be a later in the summer plant or a flower that this, this butterfly is just really happy. Zinnias are great butterfly magnets, even though they're annuals and they're not natives, but butterflies seem to like them and that's okay. And over here is a balloon flower. This is also not a native, but it's a pretty plant. It's uh, and it's happy where it's growing. So I just sort of leave it there. It is so kind of a later summer bloomer and uh, really, really pretty when it, and it doesn't really support plants. If you notice, um, if you have a, a non-native versus a native plant, you're gonna notice if you're out there observing uh, the number of butterflies and bees and uh, insects that frequent your non-natives is just about zero compared to your native, the native plants. And that, that's really the point, is that without insects, the little things that run the world, according to E.O. Wilson, we will not be here long. And I, you know, we covered that last month um, on the last month's um, talk. And yeah, that's really true. It, it, the more, more species, especially insects that are eliminated, that are become extinct, that are, uh, we are not doing ourselves a very good service. They, they pollinate everything. And, oh, insects, uh, speaking of insects, here we go. Identification, there's a, there's some native, uh, here's some natives right here. I'm gonna move this in, does, does this interfere with anybody's, uh, there, okay. I don't know if that interferes with anybody's, uh, view. Ladybug, that's a ladybug larva right there. If you see those on your, uh, on your plants, those are, those are going to eat the aphids. They, they are, they are big aphid eaters. They're, um, I'm all for that. I, you know, <laughs> and, uh, also lace wings, lace wings are damselflies, damselflies and dragonflies are fantastic, uh, predators on uh, any kind of aphids. Uh, they eat lots of what we call bad bugs. Um, they're fantastic. They're amazing. And uh, the more native plants you have and the more uh, I just seen lot, I have seen lots and lots of marvelous dragonflies out in, in my uh, garden beds. And it's fun to watch. They are really a blast to watch. Hoverflies and lots of different flies. It'd be surprising. That looks like a bee, but it isn't. That's a hoverfly. There are sylphid flies. There are lots of native flies that are pollinators. There, um, and it's so it's not all just bees. And as far as bees are concerned, solitary bees like mason bees, lay our uh, leaf cutter bees. Um, they are all over. Um, they're, everybody gets mixed up with honeybees and they are mix upable with honeybees. I look at a bee and I say, yeah, oh, it's a bee, but, and also bumble, of course, bumblebees are obvious, but there are solitary bees that we don't even know about that, um, that live in little holes that live underground. They, uh, they are huge pollinators and 
if you look at that, there's 3,600 solitary bee species native to North America. That just blew my mind. That's, these are just amazing statistics. Ground beetles, these are little workers. They, they move things around, they, they uh, prey on ants. And not that ants are bad, ants are not bad. Uh, but ants, they, they kind of equilibrium, they, they kind of kill off some, they eat the ants and everything is the great circle of life. Fireflies, this is kind of a rare shot of one that's out in the daytime that is on a Asclepius tuberosa, which is the orange butterfly weed. I love fireflies and I don't know if you ever, if you've noticed and you probably have if you're my age, uh, when you were young, there were fireflies all over the place. When I was very, very young, I used to get up out of bed and go look at the fireflies in the summer on, you know, I would stand on my back porch and just look at them because they're fascinating, just beautiful. There were millions and millions and millions of them. Not so much now. And there's a reason for that is because we have done away with their habitat, uh, its monoculture and the proliferation of your pristine, clean lawn. There are very, very, very many uh, reasons for why insects are declining. And uh, I think one of the, it's so sad when we see that fireflies, uh, something we, our beloved fireflies are declining so much because we've really haven't done very well for ourselves and for our plants and animals. So here's some and here's a few invasives, which uh, I will get to this shortly about um, uh, what to do when you see some of these uh, creatures. The Asian longhorn beetle, the emerald ash borer, the hemlock woolly adelgid, the Asian jumping worm, spotted lanternfly, and the well, stink bugs not not so as much, but the above five, the first five that I was reading about, um, they are. You can go on IMAP invasives; those are reportable insects. You really need to report them. If you see one, report it immediately to New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, because these are extremely in, uh, harmful insects. The spotted lanternfly is a, it's, I mean, it's. Not only do they um, spread like crazy, but they are also economically, uh, for especially for New York State, because of. Note that, note what I have there. They, they uh, attack fruit crops, apples, grapes, and hops, which are big New York State uh, farm crops. So that's, a, that's really bad. And so economically, those, those spotted lanternflies are just horrible. One thing I find just kind of ironically funny is that the Another in, a, an invasive tree called the tree of heaven happens to be a spotted lantern fly uh, uh, target. They love to chew on spot on uh, on tree of heaven, but tree of heaven is an invasive species. So it's an invasive attacking an invasive, but it does two wrongs don't always make or don't definitely in this case don't make a right. We shouldn't even have them around here. But all these all these insects and the jumping worm are horribly invasive. Um, the stink bugs, they do threaten fruit crops, but their worst thing is that they they're smelly and they get in your house and they're kind of disgusting. And, uh, <laughs> but they, and they're also, if you also realize that they don't have any predators, that's why they are so prolific. And that's why invasives are that because there's no known predators for them. There's nothing here to counterattack. And invasive plants, uh, they're, and of course, like I said, they have, 
before about the insects, that's no by, by no means an exhaustive list. There are others out there. Uh, I could go on forever about those. Oh. The um, invasive plants, these are, there's lots of them around. Uh, multiflora rose, horrible. Um, the notations here, so if you look at some of the years here, around, you know, so my, my, my uh, comment earlier about Victorian times, it's, it's, yeah, that's pretty true. There were a lot of, and I do not mean to pick on Asian uh, this is not a uh, not try, trying to be anti-Asian here. Um, it's just a it, at the time that these plants were introduced, there was a lot of uh, interest in things Asian, so it was considered a good idea to introduce uh, Asian plants, Asian. Uh, uh, creatures. Also the uh, Japanese beetles, uh, another horrible invasive insect. But multiflora rose, that stuff will grow anywhere and it's extremely, uh, they, wanted, they wanted to prevent erosion with, with it. Well, except for it, the fact that it got away from everything and now you find them anywhere. They're all over the place. I have, I still have them. I'm still ripping them out. They're terribly difficult to rip out. Japanese knotweed, there are just, uh, it's, it's awful to get out. I fortunately, I'm, I myself am lucky, but I, that I don't have any, at least not to my knowledge, uh, but you know, it would not surprise me if we end up with it around. They're all spread by uh, birds and sometimes runners or under the, you know, the rhizomes, uh, seeds spreading just by wind. Tree of Heaven. There's uh, they're common. They were commonly planted as urban trees. So if you go down to the city of Albany, there's lots of trees of heaven on Clinton Avenue uh, that really should be taken down and replaced with natives. Garlic mustard. <laughs> yes, it is edible, but it's also extremely invasive, and it is just. It's a called allelopathic. So what it uh, um, that is a term that basically, uh, just a very easy description of what it does is its roots and the chemicals that are produced by its roots outcompete and literally kill off other other plants. So it if you look at a place where garlic mustard is, um, it. If you keep, you have to keep pulling it. It's just, it's very, very invasive. And um, I remember last year, year before when I was working, going by a specific place up in Burnt Hills, and it was just covered with garlic mustard. It destroys the understory. Um, and the deer, the deer will not eat this. And there's, you know, and unless they're extremely hungry, and I don't think they are that hungry. Uh, <laughs> But it's, it's just, and each one of these little tiny flowers right there just will spread just thousands and thousands of seeds. And it is a biennial plant. It, you can't let it go to flower. You just have to pull and it does have a tap root. Um, right now, there are some people that are fighting, fighting plants with plants. Um, I've actually, I've been trying this with um, my, because I do have an invasion of garlic mustard. Um, I have been trying jewelweed, which is a native plant. It's also a late blooming, uh, people consider it a weed. Um, it has been, uh, I try to, I've been trying to keep it in the areas where the garlic mustard is to see if the jewelweed will eventually outcompete it. So it will take some years to have that happen. Um, honeysuckles, there are various honeysuckles around that are non-native honeysuckles that were introduced uh, as landscape plants. And of course they got all over the place. They are spread, they spread and uh, I have several you know, it's part of when I bought the house or when we bought the house, we had what we had. And uh, I'm still, it's, it's tough to pull all these things. It's tough to get rid of them all. Uh, sometimes you have to have professional help 
to get rid of all of them. An oriental bittersweet as opposed to the regular native bittersweet. This stuff is all over and it literally will strangle, it, it strangles your trees. It just kind of wraps itself around the tree and becomes huge and literally smothers it. Um, not a, not something we really want. If you see the, if you see them, cut them. Uh, there we go. Oh, and I'm almost, am I, I don't know if I'm early or not here. And I could, I think I'm about on time here. I have a huge list of resources here, which I will make available to anybody in this. I, actually, there are uh, more here. There's apps that I didn't even get to when I was making this list. Um, these are fantastic resources for anybody who wants to find out. I will highly recommend Cornell Cooperative Extension, not just to Saratoga County, but you can plug in any uh, county that you're in and get information from the Cooperative Extension about any kind of invasive plants, um, invasive animals, invasive insects, invasive, uh, uh, even aquatic uh, wildlife, um, like the, uh, the zebra, or zebra mussels. But they have, they, and also New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, that's another fantastic resource. Uh, a few books, Dr. Tallamy's books, Bringing Nature Home, Nature Evokes, and Nature's Best Hope. The, and also he, he co-wrote uh, The Living Landscape, which is another really great book on basically on all this keystone species. He mentions just about everything, and his books are very easy to read, too. Nancy Lawson's Humane Gardener, she is a fantastic author. The rabbits, okay, so fence, uh, fence out your, the things you really want to keep. Rabbits are part of the, part of our landscape. They are part of our, part of the great circle of life. Um, there's a, uh, the uh, New York space, uh, New York State in space of species, where you report your uh, invasive species. Also, just so that's actually on the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is uh, DEC website too. Xerces Society is fantastic, and also the Pollinator Partnership. Those are great butterfly sites. Um, Xerces Society is very hardworking. Homegrown National Park that was that was founded by Doug Tallamy and some other um, individuals. The Homegrown National Park you can actually register your land on uh, your garden plots, and it become it's a it's registers all those all anybody who wants to be registered on it can be, and it's to try to map out. Uh, the pollinator, uh, pollinator gardens, butterfly gardens, native plant gardens, to see, uh, gets, gathers data, of course, but to, to also show that uh, people are actually out there working towards uh, our little bit of uh, helping our environment as much as possible. Uh, sustainable Saratoga, that's local. Um, there, I mentioned them before. They are. Uh, they are all about uh, uh, composting, sustainability, uh, environmental action group. They're fantastic. Audubon Society of the Capital Region. That's uh, we have. We I'm saying that because I'm board member, vice president this year, uh, as well as the newsletter editor. But. Um, we are also getting into the approach of native plants for birds, uh, that these things are indeed connected. And I was surprised at how many birders didn't really know about that connection. Well, yeah, it's pretty obvious, but, you know, but I didn't know about it either earlier. When 40 years ago, when I started birding, I didn't know about it either. Um, Wild Ones, that's another, they're a fantastic group, Catch Capital Region Wild Ones, that is a national organization of native plant uh, people, uh, 
native plant growers. Uh, the capital region chapter covers several area counties. Uh, highly recommend. They have a monthly program and they are constantly on Facebook. Uh, capital district, excuse me, capital district native plant society, another fantastic group. Uh, they're a little more low key, but they're out there and. Um, they also have they, their Facebook page will cover every every week they post what's blooming this week. So you can see what's blooming and where it's blooming. So you can go look at this native plant and see it. So whether it's uh, the early spring ephemerals or now we're getting now we're starting in, to get into the wood anemones and uh, uh, wild geraniums and things that are blooming later in the spring or uh, mid spring. And they will keep uh, they will keep posting what's blooming this week. Uh, Native Plant Trust that is actually based in Massachusetts, but that's another fantastic site. Um, and then I have a couple on here the places to buy native plants. Amanda's Garden that's out in uh, Rochester. Uh, she sells uh, her uh, the person's name is Ellen Fultz. She sells bare root plants. So those are plants with that are not packed in uh, soil. So, uh, I, that's not me. Um, somebody's not muted there. Uh, there we go. Um, she uh, she sells bare root plants, and the bare root plants are just that. They're bare root. They're not in dirt. So you have to get them in the ground pretty much as soon as you get them. Uh, Wild Things Rescue is located in Valley Falls, right up there in Rensselaer County at the top end of Tom Hannock Reservoir. Uh, Dawn Foglia is the proprietor. She is wonderful. I have gotten many, many, many plants from her. She is a, a great, uh, just a really wonderful uh, plant, native plant person. Catskill Native Nursery down in Kinderhook. That's another wonderful, uh, Mike Adamovic runs that. I have purchased uh, uh, plant, uh, purchased seeds from him online. And uh, another one more towards Massachusetts is Helia Native Nursery. So they, uh, and a notation from that, uh, just to let you know that it's starting to become something that's out there. Uh, buying at the big box stores or at your local supermarket is not necessarily going to get you the native plant you're looking for. Uh, many of them are grown by growers who grow huge amounts of plants. They do use pesticides. And they do use neonicotinoids, which are death to birds and death to insects. Um, that's something you want to avoid. All these growers do not use any kind of pesticides at all. Um, they are, uh, you know, I highly recommend any of these people, even if it does cost you a little more, you're getting a plant you can rely on and you're getting a plant that isn't going to poison uh, anything in your, in your soil. Or it's not going to poison anything that's eating it either. You want to see plants get eaten by the creatures that are out there. And it's obvious that that's what sustains them. Uh, down below are various uh, sites that I have found really, really helpful. The Wild Lady Bird Johnson Wild Wildflower Center, Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, Plant Finder, uh, also the Native Plant Trust. It's two that really were are fairly new to this. The National Wildlife Federation has a uh, native plant finder, and they also uh, have a, a garden for wildlife program. And I have supported that by buying plants from them. They're, they use growers that do not use uh, pesticides. However, the only problem is they do come, they don't come from our eco region here. So I'm not really a purist on that, but they're, you know, I understand if people are, uh, because sometimes native plant people kind of get the, uh, have the reputation for being condescending towards people who don't plant native plants. <laughs> uh, you know, it is, it, yeah, there's, it's a, 
you know, it's a thing. Um, Audubon Society Plants for Birds. That is a program that the Audubon Society and both the National Wildlife Federation and the Audubon Society, uh, what you do is you plug in your zip code. It will give you a list of plants, native plants that you can plant right there in your own yard. This is, it's wonderful. I've used both of them. Find it. And also New York State uh, DEC has one as well. Um, but that, and some of them you could actually, I think it's Audubon Society that you can drill down a little bit. And uh, it's uh, just amazing how, how well done these, these sites are. Um, and I'm trying to, there's just, I could probably go on forever about composting and uh, uh, pesticides and all sorts of other things, but I wanted to get to the tip of the iceberg. I hope I did that. And I'm just, I'm now ready for questions if anybody wants to have anything to ask. And I see that there are some things in the chat room here. Yes, and I'll, Carol, I'll read those off in a minute. Oh, but first thanks. off, I want to thank you for a great presentation. And a special thanks to me for giving me retroactive permission not to rake the leaves from the lawn every fall. <laughs> Appreciate that. And here's my friend. This is my special friend. This is uh, one I just bought at a plant sale yesterday. That this is this is gorgeous. This is a woodland phlox. This is a native plant. It is gorgeous. It in bloom now, and uh, it says hello. And uh, this is going to go in this afternoon as soon as I get through here. So. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, go into the chat. There were some questions, as you notice. I'm going to read through them here. Sherry asked, and I'm going to say this wrong, are all Coriopuses, I've said it wrong, I know, varieties considered native to our area? Nope. Uh, cor they're Coriopsis. And uh, no, they're, they're, um, they're all Hellenic or the Helianthus species. But um, how to determine if you're looking at your plant label? Um, it will say, it should say the Latin name. So Coriopsis is, would, should be capitalized. And then the, I can't remember, i to be honest with you, there's something in it also that I must be getting old because I can't remember all the, the Latin names. But if you see two Latin names, one, the first, the first one is, is uh, in capitalized, the second is not, like, uh, the uh, lobelia or a card or lobelia cardinalis, the L would be capitalized. The cardinalis would not. But if it's a hybrid or a variety or a cultivar, the name of the cultivar will be in single quotes right after it. That's how you tell if it's a cultivar or not. I try to shy away from them, but I understand that people have them. I have. I've got one or two out there that, but they're pretty and they provide a lot of, uh, and they don't spread that fast, so they are not as bad as we would, mm -hmm. not as bad as some of the serious invasives. Okay, uh, Sue Perry had a question. Uh, her, are you saying that non-native always means destructive? Plats like. Plants like peonies aren't going to spread, for instance. Why not plant them? No, that's correct. And I do have peonies. Uh, they do not spread very fast. Uh, no, I am not definitely not saying that all non-natives uh, and non-native invasives, you can look them up. Uh, so my peonies, as opposed, uh, so just judging from what I have in my yard, the peonies that I have, I'm keeping, but invasive, would be those crazy orange lilies that I thought was a wonderful idea to put in that I brought up from Troy when I moved up here. And those are rapid, those are considered invasive, which is why you see them all over the place and they are terrible to get rid of uh, because they spread so rapidly and pop up anywhere. Uh, and that's why you see them in ditches uh, when you're passing along the road, all of a sudden you'll see a little patch of them in a ditch. Um, they get thrown there. Uh, the, uh, the tubers get thrown there by uh, uh, just by, by mowing, you know, mowing the side of the road that spread by, you know, who knows, they spread by themselves. They're just crazy. 
but they are all over the place. But it doesn't necessarily mean, yes, plant, I do not say that you shouldn't plant panties. I personally love them and I would not have any problem with anybody. Just stay away from the ones that are invasive. The thin, okay. Yep. So Sherry had a question along similar lines. Uh, do non-invasive, do non-native varieties, if they are not invasive, do they do any harm? Not, not always. Uh, they don't do any really good, but they don't do any harm either. Certain ones, I, I'm going to go back, I'm going to hark back to those Coreopsis plants. The native Coreopsis is, of course, the better one to plant, but the varieties that I have and, you know, the varieties that are sold out there will not spread crazy uh, you just won't get as many pollinators on them. If you observe, if you've got uh, native lance leaf coreopsis or tick seed coreopsis, coreopsis next to one that is, or near one that is non-native, you're going to notice that the pollinators and the insects will feed on the native, but not necessarily they might go to and look at, and maybe chew on uh, the non-native, but not so much. And they won't visit it. They don't really benefit from it. So there's no point in eating it. Mm -hmm. So Linda asked a question, which you then talked about in your resources about, are these non-native plants available in lo at local nurseries? And that was a great list of resources you provided. Thank you. Yes, non-natives. Um, let's be really, really careful. Um, both Lowe's and Home Depot, which are our biggest big box stores around here, have sort of pledged to, but I don't know as I really believe it or not, uh, uh, to not sell non-natives. Actually, it's against the law to sell certain non-natives. I think it's against the law to sell burning bush. Uh, it is also against the law, I believe, to sell barb, Japanese barberry, um, but not always, in your, uh, not always in all states do they outlaw that. Um, it is because they, are, they spread so rapidly and they are overtaking native species, which means that those plants will don't support insects and wildlife. So that just sort of blows everything else away. Um, and definitely that's why we see not as many insects around. But anyway, so the big box stores sort of are pledging. And I think they're, they might be, you know, upper management is probably finally getting the idea that, oh, this is, it's in demand. It is economically to our advantage to sell native plants. So you see uh, plant companies like Proven Winners in uh, Lowe's and Home Depot, but read them really carefully. Proven Winners is pretty good, but they also sell a lot of cultivars too. Mm -hmm. So Sue Perry asks, are annuals non-native by definition since they're not hardy in this area? Uh, we have a lot of native annuals. Um, little things like the things that come up every year, like the bluettes and uh, little native pinks. Those are not perennial plants. Those just come up every year. Violets are actually annuals. Um, so they're, and pussy toes, those are the little, they're little, uh, they're amazing little things that just kind of crop up in your lawn. Um, so those are, yes, there are many, many native annuals. They are available. You can look them up. Uh, that's one resource I didn't put in my list. Um, yeah, there are lots of them around. As a matter of fact, I believe um, the, this morning's Times Union, um, Margaret, or, uh, not Times Union, Margaret Roach, who is a, she's out in Western part of New York State. She, uh, she has New York Times, uh, she's in the New York Times. She has a uh, column in New York Times and also has a blog, uh, Garden, A Way to Garden is her blog. She covered in today's, today's blog, covers native annuals. So I would highly recommend if you do get the New York Times, read that. Um, I didn't get a chance to really read it today, but she covers native annuals. Yes, they are around. Okay. Dee Porcher said, thank you, a wonderful program. Sue Perry had another question that is for a comment. There's a person who deals in native plants who comes to the Saturday farmer's market in Saratoga. At least they did pre-COVID. You run into that person by chance? 
Um, I wouldn't, I do not know them personally, but I might, I, let's put it this way. If I were to, if I were to take a guess, it was probably Jesse Elwert Peters of Jesse Ecology, who I should have mentioned before on my resource list. And I, I will add to that list when I send, that's another thing I just want to mention before I forget. I want to make that whole list available. So if anybody is looking for it, um, Don, would you mind being the, uh, if I send nope. you the list, would you mind sending it out to people? Because I really highly recommend. Uh, Jesse, uh, Jesse Elwert Peters owns Jesse Ecology, and she is a, a native plant landscape designer. Uh, she has also branched out to doing retail, and she has uh, she's now in Boston Spa. She used to be in Green, Greenfield Center, which is the Saratoga County. Um, I also I know her personally. I uh, haven't seen her in a while, but because uh, she's really busy right now, especially from COVID because of the interest in native plant gardening. She has, her business has just exponentially uh, uh, increased. Um, but anyway, she sells native plants. I have purchased several from her uh, over the years. Um, she's wonderful. And seriously, she does a lot of work for, um, a lot of companies around here have uh, gone, have uh, used her services to plan and uh, plan landscape designs land, uh, and plant native plants for outside their organizations, uh, which is wonderful. I think the more companies that get into this, the better off we all are anyway. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a nice PR thing too, besides being just good for the environment. Yes. Uh Another question here from uh, Linda, who asked, is it okay to have non-natives in containers? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I am a big on that myself, because that way it keeps them from, keeps them from especially rhiz uh, plants that spread by rhizomes and plants that spread by, by uh, runners. Better to keep them mm -hmm. in containers. Uh, there are ways to contain... Um, some of the plants, not all, um, by digging deep around, if you're planting them in the ground in your garden bed, to plant them, kind of put a container down, maybe about a foot of metal or something solid that they're not going to poke through, not just landscape fabric, because that, that's not going to work. But um, so, you know, any kind of, uh, any kind of, uh, barrier that is going to stay there uh that's mm -hmm. going to prevent them from coming through however uh, containers are easier uh you know definitely i i do the same thing my deck box uh i've got planters with uh potato vine in there which is something i would never put in the ground uh that's just for purely ornamental the then those are you know just things that are fun to have for spots of color and they look nice mm -hmm. Stephanie said, thank you. This has been so informative. Uh, Sherry had a question she'd like to ask you. Sherry, can you go ahead, please? Uh, yes. Are you still on uh, visual recording? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I had a question. The I have some azaleas and lily of the valley shrub, which, you know, I just languish in joy, you know, sitting on my porch and watching the bees just you know, have parties. Um, they, they are just delighted. Um, and I did get them at, you know, Lowe's or, you know, one of the, the bad stores, I suppose. Um, but if basically, if the bees are happy, then we're doing a good thing. That, that's my first question. Well, they, are, they may be feeding on it. They may be, they may not necessarily be pollinating. Uh, they're not going to pollinate a non nate Oh, well, they do actually, pardon me for misspeaking there. Um, that's how some of them become spread elsewhere, um, which is not necessarily a good thing. And we try to not keep, not do, I've got Lily of the Valley, you know, definitely. Uh, I've got rhododendron that isn't native either, but, you know, sometimes you'll see, you'll see insects, but you won't see as many as you will around something that they can actually benefit from. So those bees are not necessarily benefiting from the azalea, but they are, you know, they could be feeding on it. They could be, they could be nectaring and they're hanging out. And if they seem happy, then they're happy. They're not getting poisoned. That's really the important thing. They're not getting poisoned, but they may not get it. It's like eating junk food. That I, that's kind of the, <laughs> I can, 
Yeah, it's a, kind of the way I can equate it. You know, if they're um, they if a butterfly nectars on uh, a butterfly bush, for instance, a monarch shows up at your but at your Budleia, that purple butterfly bush, purple and pink, big panicles on it. Um, that is a a plant that doesn't really benefit they can they can get that nectar from it but they can't really use it they can't use it as a host plant it doesn't really provide all the nutrition they need which is so you know pr uh planting that's the thing there's about fruit trees and fruit bushes of uh, the uh, service berries and any kind of the little uh staghorn sumac any of the little fruit bearing trees that we have around here that are native are beneficial to all the pollinators and birds. Birds just love that stuff during the winter time. That's what part of what they survive on. Yeah, I, I had a follow up question, um, slightly different topic. Um, I have some wild ginger that I've gotten from a friend and it is beautiful. But for the life of me, I can't understand ecologically, it doesn't flower. Why is that beneficial? It does flower. Take a look right now underneath, underneath the leaf. Okay, okay. See a little brown flower. It doesn't look like a flower flower. It's kind of a tri, it's kind of a triangular looking thing. It's kind of brown with a little white center on it. Those are their flowers. How cool is that? It is cool. And not only the only the other one that I know of that has a flower underneath like that is a May apple, which is also a uh, it's a really bizarre looking plant that is a humongous leaf with a white flower underneath it. And I have that. You do? OK, then you're familiar with them. They're really cool. Uh, <laughs> they are a spring ephemeral and they're they're uh, they're blooming right now, actually. Yeah, they look like little umbrellas stuck in the yes. ground on little popsicle little. sticks. <laughs> yep. That's exactly what they look like. And then the leaves are very shiny and enormous. It's really, really fun to look at. But that's a, you know, that's a, just a fun thing to, I like leaves. I like the textures. I like the looks of different things. And I'm going to, I will be the first person to admit here that yes, I do not have all natives. Um, there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are things that I call legacy plants that I came up here with that were my great grandmothers and my grandmothers, but also I put in uh, my, some of my own. Uh, and uh, I am a sucker literally for Japanese Hekone grass. I just love the way it looks. It's a bright lime, yellow, uh, limey, green, yellow, spiky, marvelous grass. It does not spread huge. It is not a non-native, it's not an invasive plant. It's non-native, but it's not an invasive. So not all native or not all non-natives are invasive. Some of them contain themselves very well. It's the invasives you got to watch out for. I think there's a heliopsis that also flowers underneath the leaves. Oh, okay. Then that's one I got to read up on because that's, uh -huh. like I said, I'm not you know, I'm no. Fun. It's just such a fun thing because it's not something that's one of my favorites, and it's in a spot where there's shade, and I hardly ever look at it. And you don't see the flowers unless you get on your knees and peek underneath it at the right time. But when you do, it's very fun. Yeah, there. You know, it's just. I think it's great to just go out and look at everything and observe and uh, sit and watch the fun things happen. Um, and this observ observation wise, and this is uh, just an aside, just from my own. Being here 36 years and seeing things change over 36 years, and they do. Uh, since I started doing more native plants, even though around me there's a lot of native stuff, and there's also a lot of non natives, but there's a lot of native stuff around here because it's fairly country out here. Uh, but the bluebirds, the orioles, hummingbirds, I and native bees, it's just wonderful to be able to observe all the things that are here that weren't here when I first when we first got here. And uh, that that makes me feel good as a person as, as somebody that's actually, you feel like you're contributing something in this time of such distress that we all have so many stressors between politics and the climate change and uh, Roe v. Wade and all these other things that are making us crazy that you can do, you can pick one thing or two things to really work on that you actually feel like you're actually 
accomplishing something. I hope that makes people feel better. It made me feel better anyway. Yes, it did. Only would it be, make feel, people be, feel better too to go out and start planting some native plants? No matter how small your garden plot is, uh, it's doing some good. Even if it attracts one butterfly, if that's all you see during the course of the year, it doesn't mean it's the only one that's there. It means that they're around and it could be that somebody's, uh, that maybe there's a monarch that's going to lay her eggs there. You just don't mm -hmm. know. And it requires a little observation. You know, and I will, uh, you have to be out there looking at them. I'm not always out there looking at things, but you know, so be it. But any, but uh, it's, it, it makes you feel better about doing something. You know, it's taking action for our environment. Mm -hmm. I have another Carol, question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sherry. Um, I was just curious, now that you brought us back to reality and things we should worry about, uh, that was my only part that, of this you know, talk that I didn't enjoy. I was in you know, my la-la land. But the fireflies, is there a prognosis for the species? Because I used to you know, joyfully, in, you know, in, I just used to love uh, seeing them, catching them, watching them. And you're right, you don't see them. Well, I, it, the prognosis is not great. Uh, I'm not going to say they're going to become extinct immediately, uh, because there are there is a there is definitely an awareness about this. And, and the more and of course the more native plants we plant, the more insects are going to be sustained. It's insects. In, I think fireflies are kind of one of my local. Barometers. Examples of of this decline in insects and decline in birds. Insects are just they're the things that run the world. That is, it's really true. Because the more and as soon as you pull out one species of something, it affects everything else. Uh, because okay, so you're taking away the food for a species, or if you're taking away a species and it takes its, it, whatever it print, uh, whatever it preys upon, whatever it eats is also affected. Is there a particular plant that fireflies are attracted to, or is it the gestalt of the ecosystem? It is a, the ecosystem. They okay. are, you know, they will, they'll feed on, I'm not exactly sure what they feed on, but they are, uh, their pro the problem is, with them, with fireflies, it's mostly the number of lights that we use at night to light up our environment. Uh, the human, human in, uh, you know, lighting up everything at night, that does not help, it screws them up. I mean, they get totally messed up by that because it's not natural. Uh, same with birds, birds get attracted to light and uh, non-natural light, it's the same problem. It's it's. Uh, it also that also affects moths. Moths are very badly affected by the number of lights that we have. And if you look at a you know if you look at a map of the U.S. especially with all the cities and all the, the just the mid lights at night and how many lights we have, serious problem. Okay. If there's no other questions, Carol, thank you so much. Well, thank you for thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it, and uh, I will definitely probably by tomorrow send that list of resources and actually uh, include the ones I neglected to put on there or didn't have room for. So um, thank you all. I appreciate it, and thanks for thanks for listening. Glad to appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Have a great day. Thank you, Carol. That was great. Thank you.